Curly Howard, famous for his comedic genius, had a life full of ups and downs. From his rise to Hollywood fame to his tragic demise, his story is both captivating and inspiring. But what's behind the laughter and slapstick comedy? Let's uncover the real story of this beloved Three Stooges icon. Join us as we delve into Curly Howard's life, from the moments that shaped his destiny to the untold truths behind the laughter. Get ready for a journey filled with wedding bells, international fame, and the trials of a beloved comedian. Early Life Curly Howard, whose birth name was Jerome Lester Horwitz, came into the world on October 22, 1903, in the Bensonhurst neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York City. He was born to Solomon and Jenny Horwitz, both of Lithuanian Jewish descent. Among his siblings, he was the youngest of five sons. Due to his age, his brothers affectionately dubbed him Babe, a nickname that stuck with him for life. However, to avoid confusion with his brother Shemp's wife, who was also called Babe, the family began calling him Curly. His formal Hebrew name was Yehuda Lieb Bar Shlomo Natan Halevi. Growing up, he was known for his reserved nature, unlike his mischievous older brothers Mo and Shemp. While not excelling academically, Curly displayed prowess in athletics, particularly basketball, during his school years. Despite his love for sports, he didn't complete high school. Instead, he filled his time with odd jobs and shadowing his older brothers, whom he idolized. Additionally, he had a knack for ballroom dancing and singing, often frequenting the Triangle Ballroom in Brooklyn, where he occasionally crossed paths with actor George Raft. At the age of 12, Curly faced a life-threatening situation when he accidentally shot himself in the left ankle while cleaning a rifle. His brother Moe's quick actions likely saved his life, but the injury left him with a noticeable limp and a thinner left leg. Despite the potential for corrective surgery, he harbored a deep fear of going under the knife, choosing instead to live with the consequences. To conceal his limp, he developed the exaggerated walk that would become one of his trademark characteristics on screen during his time with the Stooges. Curly's interest in entertainment, particularly music and comedy, blossomed as he watched his brothers Shemp and Moe perform as Stooges in Ted Healy's vaudeville act. Although he enjoyed being around the stage, he never actively participated in any of the routines. Nonetheless, observing his brothers' performances fueled Curly's own aspirations in the world of comedy and entertainment. Comedic Journey Curly's comedic journey began when he broke free from the constraints of Healy's control. As he gained independence, his unique comedic genius began to shine brightly. He unleashed a torrent of physical comedy, becoming a powerhouse of slapstick humor. His exaggerated reactions and hilarious vocal sound effects introduced a fresh dynamic style to audiences. Fans of all ages delighted in Curly's iconic mannerisms, such as his distinctive woo-woo walk and the Curly shuffle floor spin. These trademark moves endeared him to audiences, solidifying his place as a comedic innovator. His gift for perfectly timed pantomime reactions and lightning-fast wordplay set him apart as a true comedic genius ahead of his time. By the late 1930s, Curly had practically trademarked his lexicon of hilarious nonsense expressions. Phrases like, I'm a victim of circumstance, and his unique pronunciation of words like solely became beloved elements of his comedic style. He had transformed from a shy babe into a true superstar, widely recognized as the most popular of the Stooges during their prime years. Despite his rising popularity, Curly faced personal struggles and grueling schedules demanded by the Stooges' success. Nevertheless, his childlike enthusiasm and boundless energy endeared him to audiences, particularly children. Directors recognized his exceptional comedic skills, often allowing him to improvise freely during scenes. As the Stooges reached their peak in the late 1930s, Curly's performances became central to their films. Classics such as A Plumbing We Will Go, We Want Our Mummy, and An Ache in Every Steak showcased his ability to turn ordinary objects into ingenious comic props. Even in the most violent short They Stooge to Conga, his comedic brilliance shone through. Curly's improvisational talents were legendary, with Mo Howard recalling how Curly's forgetfulness led to spontaneous moments that kept scenes rolling smoothly. Despite occasional challenges, Curly's Brooklyn-accented reactions and expressions became iconic, 
influencing his fellow stooges for years to come. However, tensions arose when Mo suspected rising star Lou Costello of copying Curly's routines. Costello's use of Stooges' material in his own films added to Moe's frustration, exacerbated by Columbia Pictures' refusal to allow the Stooges to make feature-length films, like other comedy groups. Unlike his fellow Stooges, Curly never starred in solo short films without Moe or Larry. He remained an integral part of the Stooges' ensemble. The Rise of Three Stooges In 1928, Howard made his debut on stage as a comedic musical conductor for the Orville Knapp Orchestra. His performance was marked by unintentional comedy as he conducted with such vigor that his pants would often slip down, inadvertently stealing the limelight from the band. Moe, his brother, later reflected that Howard's antics sometimes outshone the musical performances. While Howard enjoyed his time on stage, he observed the burgeoning success of his brothers Moe and Shemp alongside Larry Fine, who had become part of Ted Healy's comedy troupe known as The Stooges. Healy, a popular vaudeville star, had a routine where he would attempt to deliver jokes or songs, only to be constantly interrupted and heckled by his raucous assistants, or Stooges. This dynamic often led to disruptions from the audience. The troupe's rise to fame was solidified with their appearance in their first feature film, Rube Goldberg's Soup to Nuts, in 1930. The Three Stooges quickly garnered a reputation as one of the most influential comedy acts in American history. However, their legacy needed to be more clear due to frequent changes in their lineup. Their heyday, spanning from 1934 to 1946, saw Moe, Curly, and Larry forming the core trio, famously known as the Curly Years. Yet this lineup would undergo alterations with the subsequent inclusion of Shemp and later Joe Besser, leading to a tumultuous behind-the-scenes narrative. Initially, Moe, Shemp, and Larry were enlisted by Ted Healy in 1922 to serve as his sidekicks in the world of vaudeville. Yet Healy's exploitative tendencies drove Shemp to depart from the group 1932. Shemp Howard's departure from Healy's troupe in 932 was prompted by Healy's abrasive demeanor, volatile temper, and struggles with alcohol. Shemp's decision to leave was validated when he secured a contract with Vitaphone Studios in Brooklyn. Upon Shemp's exit, Moe suggested their younger brother Jerry as a replacement, despite Healy's initial skepticism about Jerry's comedic abilities. However, Jerry's willingness to embrace a new persona marked by a shaved head convinced Healy leading to the emergence of Curly Howard. In 1934, recognizing the limitations of their partnership with Healy, Moe proposed a clean split from the vaudeville star. This decision led to the trio adopting the name The Three Stooges and signing with Columbia Pictures, where they found considerable success in producing two real comedy short subjects. Their third short, Men in Black, earned them recognition and movie star salaries, solidifying their status as comedy stars, with Curly playing a pivotal role in their comedic endeavors. However, Curly's health deteriorated due to his excessive lifestyle. With Curly incapacitated, Moe turned to Shemp to fill the void, despite Shemp's reservations stemming from his burgeoning solo career. Nevertheless, he agreed, recognizing the importance of supporting Moe and Larry's film careers. Shemp remained with the Stooges, appearing in 76 comedy shorts, though the Curly era remained revered as the Golden Age. The passing of Shemp Howard in 1955 marked a significant transition for the Stooges. Moe contemplated disbanding the group, but Columbia Pictures urged him to enlist a replacement from their contracted pool of actors. This led to the recruitment of comedian Joe Besser, who starred in the final 16 Columbia shorts. However, this era was widely regarded as lacking in the comedic prowess that had defined the Stooges' earlier years. The decline in the quality of their shorts coincided with changes in the film industry, as shorter formats faced diminishing popularity. Moreover, Moe and Larry, now past their prime, struggled to maintain the dynamic violence that had become their trademark. In 1957, the Stooges were unceremoniously dismissed by Columbia Pictures. Nonetheless, Moe and Larry found a fitting replacement in Joe Dorita, and the trio continued to find success through television and feature films throughout the 1960s. Personal Life 
Curley's journey from comedic success to personal turmoil unfolded against the backdrop of his rising popularity and demanding schedule. Despite the laughter he brought to millions, his personal struggles began to overshadow his professional achievements. Fans of Curley often failed to grasp the physical toll his comedic performances exacted. The constant touring and relentless schedule left him exhausted, pushing him to cope with the strain through unhealthy means. Food and alcohol became his solace, leading to rapid weight gain and volatile mood swings. These choices took a toll on his health, straining his heart and elevating his blood pressure to dangerous levels. Behind the scenes, Curly battled deep-seated insecurities about his appearance and relationships. Despite being adored by legions of female fans, he harbored worries about his perceived unattractiveness, exacerbated by his shaved, bald head, a trademark of his stooge persona. This insecurity manifested in his romantic life, marked by three failed marriages between 1930 and 1940, each ending in divorce as he struggled to maintain lasting connections. His personal struggles intensified as his career soared. The physical demands of comedy, coupled with relentless publicity tours, pushed Curly to his breaking point by 1945. Cracks began to appear in his performances, hinting at the underlying turmoil. Off-screen, Curly's personality contrasted sharply with his on-screen antics. He was introverted, rarely socializing unless under the influence of alcohol, a habit he increasingly turned to as the stresses of his career mounted. His marital life was tumultuous, marked by four marriages and two children. His second marriage to Elaine Ackerman produced a daughter, Marilyn, but ended in divorce in 1940, coinciding with a period of weight gain and declining health. Despite his popularity, Curley's insecurities made him vulnerable to exploitation by women seeking to take advantage of his fame and fortune. During World War II, the trio's filming schedule halted annually for seven months, allowing them to entertain troops. However, the intense work schedule took a toll on Curley's health. He refrained from drinking while performing, but indulged in excessive drinking after hours to cope with the stress. Despite his struggles, Curley found solace in his love for dogs. He frequently adopted strays during tours and kept several as pets at home. His brother Mo urged him to settle down, hoping marriage would bring stability to his life. However, Curley's brief marriages, including his tumultuous union with Marion Buxbaum, only adversely affected his fragile health. In his final marriage to Valerie Newman, Curley found some stability. He married Valerie Newman in July 1947, and they welcomed a daughter named Janie in 1948, but this period of bliss was short-lived too. Health Issues In 1944, signs of a decline in Curly Howard's health began to surface. His performances in films such as Idle Rumors and Booby Dupes revealed a Curly with a deeper voice and slower actions. It's believed that between the filming of Idiot's Deluxe and If a Body Meets a Body, he may have experienced the first of several strokes. Following the completion of Rockin' in the Rockies in December 1944, Curly, at the insistence of his brother Mo Howard, checked himself into Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara on January 23, 1945. There, he received a diagnosis of extreme hypertension, retinal hemorrhage, and obesity. This diagnosis forced him into a period of rest, leading to only five short films being released in 1945, a notable decrease from the typical output of six to eight films per year. Despite Moe's pleas for Curley to be granted time off upon his discharge, Harry Cohn, the head of Columbia Pictures, refused to halt production on the profitable Stooge shorts. The Stooges, therefore, had a five-month hiatus between August 1945 and January 1946. During this break, they embarked on a two-month live performance commitment in New York City, working tirelessly seven days a week. Returning to Los Angeles in late November 1945, Curley's physical condition had significantly deteriorated. Although the team's 1946 filming schedule at Columbia resumed in late January, it consisted of only 24 days of work from February to early May. Despite having eight weeks off during this period, Curley's health continued to decline rapidly. By early 1946, Curley's voice had further deteriorated, making it increasingly difficult for him to remember even the simplest dialogue. His weight loss was noticeable and lines had begun to crease his face. 
His final appearance as an official member of the Three Stooges came in Half Wits Holiday, released in 1947. During the filming on May 6, 1946, Curly suffered a severe stroke while waiting to shoot the last scene of the day, sitting in director Jules White's chair. When Moe went to retrieve him, he found Curly with his head dropped to his chest, unable to speak or move properly. He was immediately rushed to the hospital, where he spent several weeks at the Motion Picture Country House in Woodland Hills before returning home for further recovery. In January 1946, Shemp temporarily replaced Curly during live performances with the expectation that Curly would eventually return. However, Curly's health continued to deteriorate and it became clear that he would not be able to resume his role. As a result, Shemp's involvement with the Three Stooges became permanent. Curly made a brief cameo appearance in Hold That Lion in 1947 and attempted another cameo in Malice in the Palace in 1949, but his scenes were ultimately cut due to his declining health. Despite his ongoing health struggles, Curly found some happiness in his personal life. However, Curly's condition continued to worsen, culminating in a second massive stroke later in 1948, which left him partially paralyzed. He began using a wheelchair by 1950 and was admitted to the Motion Picture and Television Fund's country house and hospital for treatment. Though he was released after several months, he returned periodically. In February 1951, Curly was admitted to a nursing home where he suffered another stroke in March. By April, he had relocated to the North Hollywood Hospital and Sanitarium where he spent his remaining days. The Decline The Decline of Curly Howard, a cherished comedian renowned for his vibrant performances as part of the Three Stooges, traces back to his terrible health which tragically culminated in his premature passing at the age of 48. Initially, as Curly's health faltered, his brothers devised a strategy to repurpose old vaudeville material to sustain Curly's income. Despite their best efforts, Curly's health continued to deteriorate. In a bid to salvage his career, Curly persevered, but successive severe strokes left him in need of prolonged hospitalization and convalescent care. Once celebrated for his lively and dynamic acts that enthralled audiences both on stage and screen, Curly found himself grappling to articulate even the simplest of needs to his distraught wife as his health declined. By February, he was confined to the hospital, grappling with severe pneumonia and infections stemming from bed sores aggravated by his immobility. His weight plummeted due to inadequate nourishment, and he drifted in and out of consciousness sporadically. Despite earnest attempts to stabilize his condition, by April, hope began to dwindle as Curly lay motionless, ensnared in a near-immobile state, enduring a cruel fate after years of bringing boundless laughter and delight to countless fans. In December 1951, as Curly's health continued to deteriorate, suggestions were mooted for Curly to be transferred to a mental institution, but Moe, unwavering in his dedication to his brother's well-being, balked at the idea. Consequently, Curley was relocated to the Baldy View Sanitarium in San Gabriel, California. Despite his brother's tireless efforts to ensure his comfort, Curley's condition deteriorated further, prompting Moe's summoning from a Columbia film set on January 7, 1952, to assist with Curley's final relocation. However, their endeavors proved futile, and Curley succumbed just 11 days later. On January 18, 1952, surrounded by his beloved wife Valerie and faithful dogs, Curly Howard passed away, his body succumbing to the immense health tribulations he had endured over the preceding decade. His death was officially attributed to a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Curly's demise marked the conclusion of an era for comedy, leaving behind a legacy permeated with laughter and joy. The news of Curly's passing reverberated through the comedy community, eliciting an outpouring of tributes commemorating his pioneering contributions to physical comedy and his unparalleled ability to evoke joy in millions. Nevertheless, as the adage goes, the show must go on. Curly's surviving Stooge brothers, Moe and Larry, alongside Shemp, who reluctantly stepped in as Curly's immediate replacement, endeavored to soldier on without their vivacious counterpart. However, despite their valiant efforts, an undeniable void persisted. While Shemp possessed talent in his own right, he lacked Curly's infectious high energy and childlike exuberance. 
The once seamless chemistry between the trio was conspicuously absent without Curly's electrifying presence on screen. In adherence to Jewish customs, Curly was accorded a funeral and laid to rest in the Western Jewish Institute section of the Home of Peace Cemetery in East Los Angeles, California. His passing left an indelible void in the hearts of fans and colleagues, signifying the end of an epic in comedy while leaving behind a legacy destined to endure for generations. Legacy Curly Howard, widely celebrated for his comedic genius, left an indelible mark on the entertainment industry despite his untimely demise. Over time, historians have come to recognize him as a pioneer in the realm of comedy. Acknowledging his fearlessness in physical humor and his impeccable sense of comedic timing, his influence extended far beyond his tenure with the legendary Three Stooges, inspiring a plethora of comedians who followed in his footsteps, including the likes of Robin Williams and Jim Carrey. Initially met with skepticism by studio executives, the enduring popularity of the Three Stooges quickly dispelled any doubts about their comedic appeal. Curly, in particular, emerged as a beloved figure, captivating audiences across generations. This resurgence of interest in the Stooges' timeless antics led to the establishment of memorabilia conventions and scholarly studies dedicated to analyzing Curly's profound impact on the evolution of comedy. Behind the scenes, Curly grappled with personal demons, including health issues and tumultuous relationships. Yet, he remained steadfast in his dedication to bringing laughter to audiences, even as his own well-being deteriorated. His unwavering commitment to his craft, despite facing numerous challenges, serves as a testament to his resilience and unwavering passion for comedy. His legacy extends far beyond the realm of entertainment. His deep love for animals remains a defining aspect of his enduring impact. Inspired by his compassionate nature towards stray animals, Charitable organizations such as the Curly Howard Rescue Fund Trust and the Curly and His Dog Therapy Fund have been established to carry forward his legacy of kindness. These initiatives provide essential support and care for shelter dogs, as well as invaluable assistance for disabled veterans through therapy dog programs. His contributions to comedy and his unwavering humanitarian spirit ensure that his memory lives on. In a world where laughter is often the best remedy, Curly's enduring presence serves as a reminder of the transformative power of humor and compassion. As time passes, Curly's influence only seems to grow, with new generations discovering and appreciating his timeless humor. Through his remarkable talent and compassionate nature, Curly Howard has left an indelible imprint on the hearts and minds of people worldwide. His legacy serves as a beacon of joy and inspiration, reminding us of the enduring power of laughter and kindness in an ever-changing world. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.